You're watching Unreal Ant Gaming. This is Gohan from Dragon Ball Z. You want to see me turn Super Saiyan? Or should I take it to the next level? I'm also the narrator, too. Next time on Dragon Ball Z, make sure and smash subscribe to Unreal Ant Gaming. As the Galactic Patrol prisoner arc now officially reaches its end, with Goku having to finish his battle against Planet Moro, with the energy having to be collected of all of our residing fighters, including the powers of Oob having to be given to Goku, and resulting in Goku having to finish Moro off once and for all by shattering the crystal on his forehead, when looking back on the previous Dragon Ball Super arcs within the Dragon Ball Super manga, the question then lingers as to whether or not the Moro arc is considered to be the absolute best arc within the Dragon Ball Super manga, or did the moral arc falls short in having to supersede the previous arcs due to its overall direction. As a quick little reminder before we begin, if of course you guys are new to the channel and have a love and passion for all things Dragon Ball and anime related, then I do encourage you guys to go on ahead and smash that subscribe button and turn on all notifications to never miss a single update video on the channel, as well as giving this video a big thumbs up by slapping that like button down below if you guys are simply stoked, ready, and excited to see what the future holds for the Dragon Ball Super manga only because this is now, by comparison, the longest story within the Dragon Ball Super manga, and considerably, when of course Toei Animation goes on ahead to animate this and bring back the Dragon Ball Super anime, this just might actually be the longest arc that we've ever seen be done in Dragon Ball Super, especially when they go through with animating this story, only because there had been so many things that had happened within this arc alone, as joining me here today to further discuss the concept of everything that's happened within this arc is my good friend and Dragon Ball YouTuber Emish. Now, Emish, from the beginning, I would say that this arc really did capture the element of tension, only because we had the narrative be inserted of the Galactic Patrol looking for Majin Buu. Why? Because they wanted to extract the Dai Kaio from him, only because there was this very powerful prisoner that just so have happened to escape the Galactic Patrol prison, and not only is he a very dangerous and powerful prisoner, but he was also a very cunning and powerful sorcerer. So, from the beginning, I want to get your thoughts on the narrative introduced when we got to see old Moro face off against Goku, face off against Vegeta, face off against Majin Buu, up until towards the middle of this arc where some people would say it takes place roughly around Vegeta's training time when he was on Yardrad, and Goku's training session with Maris, I would say from the beginning by comparison to arcs like the Tournament of Power and arcs like the Goku Black arc, I would place Moro's introduction and Moro's early portions of the story above the TLP from the manga only because the TLP was basically a little centric in a sense where we had to go through the recruitment process. Of course, I really enjoyed seeing Vegeta versus Beerus, seeing all of the gods fight, but I would say there was something about this that had to have placed it just slightly above that, and when considering the Goku Black arc, that basically started off the same as we've seen in the anime with Bulma's death, and this shadowy figure lurking in the future, which just so happens to be Goku Black. So, from the beginning, where would you gauge the moral arc by comparison to the T.O.P. and the Goku Black story, only because, from the beginning, did it capture your interest, or did it basically leave you off to stray away, only because you weren't really being gravitated towards the overall direction that Toyo was trying to pull us in? And this question applies to everybody watching this video as to if you guys enjoyed the moral arc from the beginning by comparison to the Goku Black opener and the T.O.P. opener. So, Emish, what are your thoughts on the early portions of the Galactic Patrol prisoner story? I, I don't know how to explain it. Um, whether it's because of the hype coming from the world movie, for example, right? Because um, prior to, well, around the time that this arc started, we were also getting hype about the movie itself, right? So I think the two kind of coincided and they worked hand in hand with one another. And then after seeing the movie, we were like, yo, like that movie was great. And I'm excited for the moral arc now because the character looks different, right? I don't care how much he gets stronger. I don't care how he gets stronger. And his method of being getting stronger is probably similar to other villains that we've seen in the past. I don't care because he looks different. And I have this like Dragon Ball Super Burly movie high going on right now, right? So that might be that. But I think the presentation was handled well. 
you know, like the whole Galactic Patrol, they were utilizing characters that we haven't seen in quite some time. We even got some cameos with like, you know, uh, Tien and Yamcha and Krillin and um, even Master Roshi was fighting and, you know, like Moro as a villain felt cool. Um, he kind of utilized his henchmen properly in a way that really put you know, Goku and Vegeta at a disadvantage despite them being stronger than Moro at the time. We even get backstory between like the Dai Kaio, right? The, uh, the Great Dai Kaio versus him originally. South Kai was there. Like, there was a lot of characters in this arc alone. And I think it was handled pretty well. Like, it was fun. Um, Maris was also a new face who started to grow, you know, on me over time because he was doing things that. It just seemed really cool and really fun like the way he would handle himself he didn't really have to use power to overcome his opponents and it's been a while that it's been a while since we've seen something like that because dragon ball super had this massive power creep especially after the tournament of power and if you correlate the anime to the manga then for sure because like you know surpassing gods and all the, like gods of destruction were surpassed like eight times in the tournament of power alone right as far as the uh, anime is concerned but the manga not so much it was pretty like straightforward and then we actually see the gods of destruction fighting prior to that so it's like it's been a while since we've gotten something like this where it wasn't just about how strong you were but who you were and how you apply who you are uh you know in regards to your opposition so that was really fun um in comparison to other arcs for sure too though the other arcs had a different feel to them as well because even though moral was an was an obvious threat um you know goku black the whole thing was a monster for example was uh he was a god, obviously, and he had this ideology of, like, you know, uh, the Zero Mortals plan and things of that nature. Um, and while it was cool, there were parts of it that just were just garbage and stupid. Um, like, in the anime, Trunks get he, Trunks gets, like, super plot-wanked for no reason. Um, like, I agree with him being the guy to finish everything off, but it's, it's just how he gets there. Um, he gets the power of rage because he's upset that he can't be Goku Black, right? He just punches the floor and starts screaming. But then, like, prior to that, he watched his mom be vaporized point blank range and there was no power of rage there right so it's like <laughs> you know things that things like that really start to make you question it and i know we're talking about the manga but i just can't, can't help but reference the execution for the anime just simply because i mean they share the same brand name right like the end goal is essentially the same to some extent so the manga then you have the terminal power the terminal power was just like it starts off cool because we see goku fighting the way he should Whereas in the anime, he's like letting his guard down. He's like completely retarded. Not to say he never was retarded, but in the anime, it's a lot more blatant. Um, in the manga, he's, you know, he's fighting five on one, like as a Super Saiyan. So is Vegeta. Android 17 and 18, they're going to work. Frieza's going crazy. Frost is eliminating people. Kale uh, gets like f four to five universes erased by herself. Um, Gohan is kind of like a G. He feels like he's relevant. There's a lot of things happening. And then suddenly it just gets rushed because of the Broly movie, essentially, right? And then the Broly movie is coming out, so that's why it's weird. It's kind of difficult to um, even reference the Terminator Power because it's because of the Broly movie and becomes because things of that nature that things in the Terminator Power ended up being rushed, obviously. And then we leave the Broly movie going into the next arc excited simply because of the Broly movie. But the Terminator Power was a huge miss, was a huge miss because the anime shares a specific narrative um, it tries to depict, like, it really tries to grandstand a specific narrative, and that's surpassing gods of destruction, surpassing the gods, overcoming your limits, so on and so forth. But we didn't see gods fight in the in the anime, but we saw them fight in the manga, and the manga just felt like it had a more, it had such a bigger, um, it just felt like that the the narrative from the anime would have fit so much better with the manga because we've seen the gods fight. And then in the Terminal of Power, if the idea is surpassing the gods and overcoming your limits then it would hold more value because we saw the gods fight in the manga. So it's just easier to like the moral arc or the Galactic Patrol prison arc, whatever you guys want to call it, just because there was so much happening and it wasn't always about power. It was just flat out fun. It felt fresh. It felt like I was reading something. It felt like I was reading Dragon Ball. It felt like a Dragon Ball product. But then obviously, you know, uh, in Toyo fashion, uh, things just start to go downhill after a certain point in time, and yeah. I think the beginning was really cool, only because we're back on Planet Namek, we have Goku and Vegeta losing several times, even though Vegeta was using Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan Blue, Super Saiyan Blue Evolution, this whole time, this guy was taking not just Vegeta's power, but Goku's power, and I love how Goku kind of referenced it by saying, hey, something doesn't feel right, you know? So from the beginning, we get to know that this dude isn't your, you know, ordinary brute 
force type of fighter where he's just strong and that's it, right? So I think I also really enjoyed seeing Majin Buu involved because Buu hasn't done anything. Like in, in Dragon Ball Super as a whole, he hasn't done anything. He was going to be doing something in the Universe 6 tournament, they pulled him away. He was going to be a part of the Tournament of Power, pulled him away. So he had no involvement in anything that had to do with Goku Black or Murzumasu. No involvement, barely any with Beerus. He didn't do anything in the Broly movie, so it was really cool to see that element. And at first, I really wasn't enjoying Maris, because I was like, alright, well, it's kind of too far-fetched to suggest that he is an angel. But then when it came out that he was, it was like, oh, that's different, right? It's, it's kind of expected, but not really. I loved Moro's evolution, only because his primary goal was to get the Dragon Balls, to restore his youth. But now we, we're going into the middle of the story, where... Assumingly enough, we get to see how Moro is in his prime, right? No gold tea, bigger body, more muscular tone, and we have Goku and Vegeta training inside of the Rosad and on Planet Yardrat. So, from there, did you happen to enjoy the story that much more, or did the tone kind of shift once we got closer to Goku coming back, Vegeta coming back, and then the fight having to take place on Earth? I enjoyed the story for what it was. Yeah, up until they made it up until they shifted from power isn't everything to power is everything um because then it got boring again and it's it's something that again dragon ball super struggles with uh because they make everything about power and even though that's the story right but it's like they're it, it's so one-dimensional because uh, everything just tends to feel like a one-on-one -on -one. it went from teamwork to suddenly goku versus moral uh vegeta versus moral then it goes back to Maris versus it, it, it just starts to become this one-on-one -on -one nonsense um, when an estab when when a narrative was already established that it's going to take more than just one person to defeat this guy and for some reason they just kept hammering on that then Moro went from some like cool looking character to some bald like I mean that's why he wasn't bald before but you get you get what I'm saying like some cell rehash some some cell rehash with like with with hit and it, it just boring and just like utter garbage it was all about power he stopped relying on his own magic even though that's where even though it's his magic that got him to where he was anyway right he stopped relying on that and valued 7-3's copy ability over himself which was stupid like you know i mean i get the copy ability was a pretty cool thing to have but there was too much emphasis on it way too much emphasis on it and it got in the way of, of moral's identity so suddenly it felt like after almost two years of being sold a specific character, at the very end, he just suddenly changes. And it just it's just downhill from there. At that point, it's like we're back to the same old bullshit that's boring in comparison to other manga material as well. It's just really boring. And it just felt stale. It didn't feel as unique anymore. It's like, uh, I don't know. And at the very end, like the, the ending was okay. Like the ending was probably the ideal ending because once again, everybody was... Everybody played a role into it again. It was fun to watch, right? But prior to that, like from chapter 61 all the way to 65, it was just, it was it was a mess. Like I, I didn't care how strong Vegeta got at that point. Didn't care how strong Goku got at that point. Chapter 64 was great because, you know, Goku was like really flexing on like, on Moral 7-3. It was insanely powerful, like, you know, in his own right. But then after that, he just goes on full hard mode. And it's just, again, it just keeps going downhill, keeps going downhill. So it was it was difficult to enjoy the ending. I think had the had the chapters from 61 to 65 been as consistent as the previous chapters that led up to that point, the ending that we got just recently would have had so much more value to people and people would be going into January into 2021 excited for Dragon Ball the same way they were going into 2020 excited for Dragon Ball because of the Broly movie, or same thing for, I mean, 2019, I believe, right? So there's that. Uh, we just don't have that same oomph that we got, you know, last year or, or two years ago that we do. You know, we, we don't have it. That that oomph, that excitement for drama was just not there. So it's like, I, which is why it's really disappointing to see, you know, the direction, uh, the, to see how, where the direction was taken as far as the manga is concerned. So it just adds on to, to what I said earlier that the moral arc was hype because of the Broly movie and the moral arc at least felt hype or at least enjoyable to read because it was an actual it was actually enjoyable to read you know but i think 
it, it's just really unfortunate that we had to go through um, a long period of enjoyment just to be disappointed and let down and bored and then get that ideal ending and then it's like we're going into the next arc or next or next year not as excited as we were before so if fans aren't excited you have to rely on fans wanting to be fans just simply because it's Dragon Ball because the Dragon Ball name was attached to it and that's just not it I mean it might be a good marketing tactic but it's just not good like you're gonna lose fans because of it people are gonna get fed up and tired of this shit like i've had people tell me they're fed up with this shit will they stop reading it no because they're fans but like having people constantly disappointed in your product isn't a good thing either and, and it certainly isn't a good legacy to leave behind so i don't know what torotaro is thinking but uh, i mean at this point it is what it is we'll just see what he has to offer in the next arc i think that once we have reached the middle portion of this arc it was insane only because Goku had the ability to now tap into UI Omen at will. We saw how Prime Moral was able to fight Omen at a relative level and even having to best him by the very end. So all of this, I think, collectively made Moral that much better only because he was a villain that did not rely on power. He did not rely on immortality. He didn't rely on his friends because we saw when he overfed Sagambo to the point where Sagambo exploded. So that was pretty cool too, right? I think that... The fight between Murzumasu and Mastered Super Saiyan Blue Goku in the manga was really good. That kind of reminded me so much of what happened with Omen Goku in Moral, only because there were lots of similarities between the two in terms of its overall, you know, narrative and the way Goku was able to hold his own. Except I did enjoy Moral versus Omen Goku more. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna go out of my way to say Ultra Instinct Omen Goku versus Prime Moral was better than mastered Ultra Instinct Goku versus Morris or Moro73, only because the Omen fight was so back and forth, the Omen fight was so, so heavy and so tense that you can see how both characters were struggling, Goku was relying on his speed, Moro was relying on his magic, so that fight was really, really good. I really enjoyed Gohan, Piccolo, Tien, Yamcha, everyone was used more in this arc, I would say, than any other, right? But that's also to say that the T.O.P. did a great job with that too because at least for the manga portion we got to see what this character was doing, what that character was doing, right? We got to see the androids return here. So I definitely think that the early portions of this story, including the middle portion, was so good. Arguably the best in Dragon Ball Super, but then I think universally once Moro 873, it all changed because Moro then stopped relying on magic he stopped relying on his friends because he had none, and we saw Vegeta, right? We had this month, two month, three month period of waiting to see what Vegeta is gonna do, what is Vegeta gonna do, what is Vegeta gonna do, what is Vegeta going to do, and he came back, he implemented and incorporated this forced spirit separation technique, and it worked, it was really cool, I don't think that we've ever seen something like that before, so it favored Vegeta heavily, and I think that at that point, one could have made the argument to say that the entire or the entire story should have ended roughly around the time of chapter 61. But then we saw how Moro 873 and he relied more on power. It wasn't about magic. So your thoughts on the ending portion of all of this to see how Maris got erased, to see how Moro relied more on the embedded abilities that he had within him to kind of become more like Cell, to kind of become more like Boo, and this is why I enjoyed Goat Moro more than Moro 7-3, because Goat Moro spoke a certain way, right? He had a specific demeanor about him. He had a very sadistic side to him. That dude was cold. He was cold-blooded, and Moro 7-3 just became a little prideful, I would say. So, what are your initial thoughts on the way everything was basically nearing its end by comparison to the Goku Black story and the Tournament of Power? Okay, so Dragon Ball Super is typically predictable. Like, it's not hard to kind of figure out what what could happen. What ends up what ends up surprising people is that, for example, for me, my standards for Dragon Ball Super are low, right? Because in comparison to Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, it's just not good, okay? It's not good. And for people who were like, but Emish, you're stupid because Akira is the one approving this uh, this manga. Well, we've seen what a modern Akira is capable of as far as the scripting is concerned. 
uh, and I would like to direct your attention to the Broly movie. So while the Broly movie was happening and we got it and we know like a lot of content was cut out, the Broly movie is the first piece of content that we got in a long time, right? That felt like a Dragon Ball product, right? Like people saw that movie and I would argue that they were just as hyped for the Broly movie that they were when Battle of the Gods, the movie first came out. And that was many years ago. So in the in between all of that, right? Nothing we got really felt like Dragon Ball. Sure, episode 109, the one hour special, that was exciting. Servers were crashing and all this other crap. Like we were all hyped for it, so was I, right? But it's not the point, right? It's like when you look at a lot of the stuff in between, it's like, dude, like what is, what's going on? <laughs> it's just not comparable to Z or Dragon Ball, right? So, be, so now that we've established that I already have low standards, when I see Toyo and, and I make my predictions and my theories and my discussions, I base them on the low expectations that I have already. So when I see Toyo go even lower than that, right? He surpasses the limitations of my expectations, right? Which are low already, but he surpasses it in the opposite, right? And I'm shocked because I'm like, holy crap, he's actually doing this. Like, this is what he's doing. So it doesn't, it, it, it's, it doesn't end up becoming that, oh, I hate Dragon Ball Super or I'm just a hater and all this other shit. It's just like, dude, I've read Dragon Ball stuff. I've watched Dragon Ball stuff. So I know what it looks like. So when I see something less than that and substantially less than like a substantial difference, I'm going to be like, what the fuck is this? What are you trying to sell to me right now? Right, so that's how I look at it. And as far as like the endings, I, I like the MZ ending because MZ felt unbeatable, right? And they carried that unbeatable kind of factor on, and they brought in this, and they brought in the Omni King. Like that spoke volumes to who Zamasu was because of his immortality and things of that nature. And it, for once in a, in, a, in quite some time, we didn't get some massive plot wank, you know, like we did in the anime. Like Trunks just he doesn't even know he, he doesn't even know he's using the Genki Dama. It's just there. Right, but in the manga, though Trunks plays a like a lesser role, he's still there to assist. Right, Goku gets a power up; he's able to fight MZ equally, but that doesn't work. Right, so now what's left? They can't fuse because they instantly defuse. Vegeta, you know, he's stronger. He has a new technique. What are they gonna do? How are they gonna beat this guy? Oh shit, the Omni King, and then the Omni King comes in. So it 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 solidified the idea that. Okay, we didn't expect that simply because we we're, we're so used to Goku getting some ass pull plot wank thing, right? At least that's how a lot of fans perceive it, but we didn't get that. Instead, we got like the Omni King comes in, erases him, and it's like, whoo, we dodged a bullet. Because <laughs> there there was certain death had they not defeated or merged the monster then. Though it's also implied that um, both Whis and Beerus possess something that could deal with uh, merged monster still. But that's not the point. You know, the point is that it felt unbeatable but this this ending is cool because once again even though Mer even though planet moral once upon a time he did feel unbeatable they still found a way to defeat him anyway and they all worked together to do it you didn't have that same atmosphere with Murzamasu. there was nothing that they could do to defeat this dude nothing whatsoever right just nothing so that's the difference between the two arcs specifically tone of power i mean who cares like the manga just was rushed therefore it lost value even though the ending was similar to the anime it just really lost value the anime handled it much better because there was a lot more emotion a lot more character trauma you know there was a lot more things present there um consequences felt higher in the anime you know we got we got different perspectives um in the manga we do get a, we get we get jiren's perspective which is unfortunate that we didn't get it in the anime uh, maybe in spending in, instead of spending so much time you know, shoving Ribrianne in, in my face, like her fat ass into my face, they could have just elaborated on the focal character that Goku has to surpass, which is Jiren. But instead they gave us Ribrianne. So we we see that both iterations have their issues, but the anime will always have a specific advantage over the manga because it's animated. Like there's a lot of visual eye candy happening. Um, I, and maybe eye candy is probably not the best word to use, but it just tends to have an advantage, right? Like. The anime can showcase specific punches and kicks that the manga can't because it's it goes it operates based on panel. It's limited to specific pages. Like you have one page here, one page there. So, but it's because th the anime has that advantage that it tends to be lackluster in other things. And the anime has a lot of issues. So, but that's where the manga should, in theory, be able to utilize its advantage that it has over the anime, which is dialogue, right? Uh, the, the the ability to explain certain things. 
the ability to flesh specific things out and the ability to, you know, at least give people the feeling like they understand what they're reading. But the manga, again, it, it totally just doesn't do that. <laughs> His dialogue is doo-doo, right? An example, like Piccolo says that Fusion wouldn't be able to work against Moro, but later on he's confident and he tells Jocko that there'll be nothing left in here when I'm done. Like, he could take him on himself. Like, it's, it's fucking stupid. So, you know, shit like that makes it difficult to look at Dragon Ball in both the anime and the manga and like it. Because in comparison to Z and the original Dragon Ball, they were both consistent with one another. But Super, they're all over the place. They don't know, it, just, it just feels like they don't know what they're doing with it. And they're simply relying on the fact that it's called Dragon Ball. They're relying on its name and they're running on its coattails. It's really unfortunate. So again, I know it comes across as me hating the stuff, but you know, obviously I cover it too. And it's just frustrating when you compare, like go back and watch Dragon Ball Z, go back and read the manga and then read the super manga and, and watch the super anime. And tell me, tell me with like, be genuine, try to be genuine about it, that they're, that they're on the same level because they're not. You know, I think that the ending of the moral arc had rubbed a lot of people the wrong way only because it felt rushed. It felt as if Moro's character had changed entirely. I really enjoyed the battle between MUI Goku and displaying how superior he was by comparison to Moro. I loved to see the overall usage of Vegeta in collecting all of this energy and giving it to Goku, including the energy of Oob that I think that a lot of people have overlooked in the idea that a lot of people did not think that this was going to be possible, including myself. I don't think that anybody here actually thought that Oob was going to be a thing, minus maybe a very small handful of viewers that actually assumed the idea of Oob even being a thing in this arc, but I think that by the end of it, this was a good arc. Could this arc have been better? Of course it could have, but I think that it started off really good, the middle was really good, but I think that ultimately near the end, it really fell flat on its face. Not to complain, but the fact that if you really stop and think about Vegeta's placement, for example, he was on Yardrad for such a long time, I would have had it to where, instead of having Goku become a giant, I would have had it to where it was Vegeta that learned gigantification from Pybrara, and he used all of the abilities and all the techniques he had learned on Yardrad to his advantage against Planet Moro. I think that that would have been a much better narrative to have Vegeta play the support role in using Force Spirit Separation, in using gigantification, in possibly even using the ability to heal. I think that they really dropped the ball when trying to connect because they could have had MUI Goku be the one to basically drive the final nail home by defeating Moro, but I think that they relied too much on him in a sense to where he was the one that manipulated his key in becoming a giant. He was the one that cracked and destroyed Moro's crystal all on his own, even though he did get help. I think that it would have worked better in that sense if it was Vegeta that went out of his way to do everything he could to create that opening and then to finally have Goku capitalize by cracking the crystal. So by the end of all of this, we want to get your thoughts in the comment section below about this arc. If you guys had enjoyed the arc, if you guys had really soured on the arc because of the overall changes of direction and the changes of characters. So again, we want to get your thoughts down below. Again, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you all so much for your time. If of course you guys are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button and give this video a big fat thumbs up by slapping that like button down below. Check out and also subscribe to Emish's channel. I will leave his link located down below. Thank you all so much for tuning in once more and I'll be seeing you all down in the comment section below. Have a great day everybody and take care. Peace. And the quick little reminder before you guys go, if you guys are unaware, I do have a second gaming channel located down in the description box below. So be sure to head on over to Unreal Royale and hit that subscribe button along with turning on all notifications as to there, you guys will find all different kinds of gaming content that you will not get to find on Unreal and Gaming, titles and video games such as Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, Gears of War, Dragon Ball Z Dokkan Battle, Dragon Ball Z Legends, Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkai, G3, Minecraft, Blair Witch, and many other retro games on that channel. So if you guys are into gaming, then make sure you guys subscribe over on Unreal Royale. I want to thank you all so much for your time, and I'll catch you all in the next one. This is the Galactic Emperor of the Universe, and of course I'm here to tell you to subscribe to Unreal End Gaming. Also follow Unreal End Gaming on these social media platforms to stay connected at all times. And if you don't, then very soon you will all be dead! <laughs> oh, did someone say unrelent gaming? Oh my god. The fuck's up, on? Put on some clothes! Well, why don't you put on any clothes? What? I'm
don't need clothes. But, uh, Jesus Christ, that's huge! <laughs> What's Broly? Freezer. Uh oh. Prepare to die! <laughs> <laughs> that I'm the biggest Unreal Engine gaming fan. This is my moment. I'm a part of his notification squad. Universe 7 can have all the fun. I just want the food. And don't forget to leave a comment on this video. Show some love for the best community on YouTube. <laughs> K -k -k -k